to the main uh, business of tonight's meeting, which is um, Alison Cameron's uh, presentation on excavations and friaries in Aberdeen. Alison uh, studied archaeology at uh, Bradford University and has long been uh, based in, um, in Scotland, indeed in Aberdeen, as an archaeologist and has been responsible for some major work, particularly in that uh, city. Uh, excavations at St Nicholas Kirk, uh, other work at Marshall College and uh, work at the Seton Pottery up in Aberdeen. And she, she, she was one of the people responsible for, for developing the Aberdeen City Sites and Monuments record. She is uh, well qualified to, to, to speak to us about Aberdeen and I'm sure has got a lot of great interest to tell us about the Fridays there. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, David, Simon. Um, I, David, didn't quite mention that I worked um, at, in Aberdeen City Council Archaeology Service from the mid-80s um, until 2010, and now I run Cameron Archaeology, which is a small consultancy doing various archaeological works in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. And so some of the work that I'm talking about is um, since I left the council, and a couple of the projects are, um, you know, work that I did with the council. So. Um, I have seamlessly um, joined these into uh, a talk for you tonight about the three friaries in Aberdeen that we know something about archaeologically. Um, so to introduce you to, I mean, most of you have been to Aberdeen, but the friaries obviously are not very prominent today, but um, this is the situation of them. So the modern map and Parson uh, James Gordon's map of 1661 on the right. Um, so... Um, the Dominicans, the Black Friars, the Franciscans, the Grey Friars, and down, oops, pointer, Carmelites, the White Friars. Uh, and they're the three friaries that we've actually done archaeological work at. The Trinitarians, the Red Friars, um, there is little or nothing left of them, certainly not above ground, and we've never had chance to uh, excavate uh, in that area. So those are the three friaries. Uh, some of you will have been here when I was here last time, which was 2011, talking about the work that I'd done at St Nicholas Kirk. Um, and so you can see St Nicholas Kirk sort of sitting in the middle there, uh, and that was the site that I talked about in 2011. Now, on, on Parson, Parson Gordon's, I mean, I'll come back to this when I'm talking about each of the friaries, but essentially by 1661, you've got the black friars here. See, colour-coded with their little circles around so that you... Yeah. Um, you'll see the black, black friars here. The Franciscan Grey Friars Church is still standing at this point and was still standing until 1901. Um, the Carmelite is completely gone, um, and you'll see some pictures of that you know, when I talk about the dig, but it was basically sort of raised to the ground um, <coughs> shortly after the Reformation. And the Trinitarian, some parts of that um, survived you know, into the 19th century, but very much little remnants of it. Um, and uh, so that's the sort of summary of what, um, where, they, where they were. Um, and now I'm going to talk about each individual uh, site. And this talk actually came about, and I've actually already done this in Aberdeen last year, um, after I excavated uh, a site where we found the first evidence of the Dominicans or Blackfriars. And so this is them. This is from the, one of the books of Book of Hours showing you the Blackfriars in their black cloaks. And this is um, a, a detail of Parson Gordon's map just to show you um, that this building was still standing um, in 1661. Now, we didn't know what that building was exactly, which part of the friary, you know, whether it was the north part, the south part, the church, but that you can clearly see the street here, which now is School Hill. And so if you, if you know Aberdeen well, this is where the art gallery is now, Robert Gordon's. And you saw at the beginning Robert Gordon's College and Robert Gordon's University. Uh, and we were working for them um, when we were doing this, this work on the Blackfriars. So essentially, the, the Dominicans were founded, you know, between about 1230 and 1249. Um, <clears throat> and this is a picture of St Andrews, of course, because there are virtually there are very very few of these friary remains. But just to, you know, illustrate this this slide, um, that's one of the Royal Commission pictures, sorry, HES pictures of um, St Andrews. But essentially, very few documents survive about the Black Friars in Aberdeen. But um, there are quite a number of um, references to them in other documents. 
So, um, you know, we have um, information from civic records. So I've just given you a couple of examples here where, you know, the sorts of things that we know about them in 1554. Um, Alexander Raitch, you know, was brought for the borough court for wrongful digging of earth belonging to the Blackfriars. And so they're mentioned in quite a number of documents in that sort of way. And it's generally when somebody's done something bad. They've dug something, they've, you know, dug up their crops, they've disturbed their animals. Um, but we know quite a lot about them from these references. So, you know, sorts of crops and animals that they were fishermen, that, well, they, 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 they um, fired generally, you know, there's references to fishing and uh, fishing rights. And that uh, Aberdeen had a prior and 13 friars at, at one time. So there are various records of these in... Um, and, of course, at this time it was a very sort of semi-rural location, and so, you know, they would have been able to keep animals and, and crops very, very near to the friary. And today the site, so if you, again, if you know Aberdeen a little bit, Robert Gordon's College. Robert Gordon's College is the, is the public school, Robert Gordon's University, obviously. But this is Robert Gordon's College, it's the public school, and this is what they would call the, the old house here, with the slightly newer wings. And um, there has been a bit of archaeological work done on in the area in the past when they are building a new library. We found uh, a ditch of Cumberland's Fort that was dug in 1746, um, this is a picture of me and my colleague in the trench, our finds, the, the, the fort. So, the, you know, it's a very historical area. Uh, and so in 2009, we um, were doing a watching brief on what was supposed to be a very shallow dig in this area that you can see. So um, the old house is up here and they're putting in new car parking spaces. And it was only supposed to be, you know, a few inches dig down. And so it was a very light watching brief. Um, and so we were quite surprised to find um, evidence of walls uh, on, on this watching brief. So this is, we just found a few, I'm just gonna show you a, a photograph. We found a little fragment of wall that um, appeared possibly to belong to the friary. And this was basically the first evidence of the friary that we'd been able to find archeologically. There are quite a lot of uh, references to, in the local papers, for example, in the 18th and 19th century, to bones being found when the art gallery was built, when Robert Gordon was built, you know. So there are, there are sort of these references, but no um, actual location known. In fact, there's a reference to reburial of hundreds of bones that were found uh, when they were building the art gallery, uh, and they were supposed to have been reburied. But this was the first sort of tangible remains that we found. And what immediately drew my attention to this was that you can see here this, these stone roof tiles, which had fallen down and sort of, you know, into the earth and had remained there next to the foundation, virtually exactly the same as we found at other friaries that were raised to the ground at the Reformation. When they're removing the roof, they throw off roof tiles. And so that was what made us think that it was a possibility that this was related to the Blackfriars. We couldn't be absolutely certain at that time because the fines were very, very small number of fines. And as I said, we're only a few inches down, so also modern fines. And then in 2015, uh, again, a watching brief on what was supposed to be some cabling trenches. Um, and um, this is a trench that was being dug in front of the art gallery under the pavement, which was thought to not really warrant a watching brief. And SSE, um, who were working with a local company chap, uh, were digging this trench. And I'd been chatting to them, you know, just if you find anything interesting, let me know. I was working in a trench around the corner, you know, on the same site. Um, and the workman came home and he, and he, was, he was holding two bones like this. <laughs> And I said, oh dear, that's a pair of tibias, lower leg bones, from this, look, looks like from the same individual. And we were like, oh dear, okay. And he'd been just digging a little hand dug pit to see, to, to look for services. And uh, basically he found a skeleton underneath the pavement. Um, watching British will change after this because of course everybody thinks under pavements, everything's gone. But um, we found out that not everything had gone. Um, I like this is obviously me excavating the skeleton, but I like this because this was where they were laying the cables. So this is the, and there are my, the femurs that go with the tibias that the workmen had found. So um, I think, oh, can I just go back a second? Essentially what he'd found was a, a complete skeleton, apart from the skull which had gone, SSE had taken that out on another trench a number of years previously. 
I don't know who did that. But also um, there was a fibre optic cable running along here. So astonishing that it actually survived in, in, you know, and it was actually not in too bad condition. And so as the watching brief continued, um, we went underneath the archway here, which takes you into Robert Gordon's, uh, under the road where all these students had walked for years, hundreds and hundreds of years into the building, um, and again found quite a number of burials, um, not very well preserved, shall we say that, that they had been dug through many, many times, so, for example, this one, this is my colleague excavating a poor individual whose legs here, they've got a service trench through is the middle, and then the skull at the top of here. But, but at least something survived. Um, and very, very small amounts of uh, structural remains. So um, a wall foundation here, you can see the stones here. Um, the remains of a north-south wall foundation. Um, so we've got... The first skeleton here, we've got skeletons in here, and then the wall foundation here, and a group of individuals who are sort of on the east side of this building, uh, which possibly might be the church. Um, this is a couple of images showing that trench with quite a number of individuals. Um, this is the art side of the art gallery here. I'm, I'm mentioning that because I'll come back to the art gallery in a second, but and then Robert Gordon's, and basically they were putting in a super highway of cables, a new sub substation, and what they call a superhighway, which is for a huge number of cables, so they never have to dig them up again. So they put in, um, so that means that they had to be, it had to be two metres wide and a metre deep, hence finding 30 skeletons in, in this, you know, quite small area. Um, again, some of them in this trench, not very well preserved either. Um, you can see the skull, you can see the grave cut beautifully here, the skull, the upper leg here, electric. So, um, again, you know, for being the first skeletons or remains of, of the Blackfriars that we'd found, um, they were fairly, they'd been fairly badly treated in the past, but uh, at least uh, enough remain for us to find out a little bit about them. Uh, and here's just the plan again, showing you the north-south wall with the skeletons. Again, roughly east-west. So um, some of them had got a little off the east-west. They seemed to be closer to east-west, the nearer the wall, but further away they were then more uh, sort of southwest, west northeast. Uh, and this one, this is the wall foundation, again on the right of the picture, and several of the individuals were buried really with their head right next to the wall foundation, so as close as you could possibly get to the building, suggesting to me that that might be the wall of the church. Uh, and at other friaries we found the same, that people obviously, and at St Nicholas, people wanted to be really close to the, the walls of the, um, particularly the east wall of the building. So um, this, this man here buried with his head almost laying on the foundation, um, suggest possibly that this was the church and they were an interesting group we had several who had pillow stones so sitting beside the head just to um, balance the head in the grave to to sort of um, settle it so that it didn't roll over um, but we also had three individuals who had large stones in their mouths so um, you can see here now, these are not stones. I've put that one quite, quite... I didn't realise the screen was going to be quite so big, but you can see there very clearly that's not a stone that's fallen into the mouth, you know, that that's a stone that's been put into the mouth, um, you know, at a period when rigour had not set the jaw uh, and had, been, had actually been put into the mouth. And there are quite a number of parallels to this, but, of course, we don't really know what it means. There are examples like this one where... Um, they think that the tongue may have been removed and this flat stone placed in. Um, and there are quite a number where the stone is quite flat. Um, was it to, you know, serve as a punishment or to... We, we, we don't, we're not really sure. But um, there's certainly um, Germanic laws about, um, codes about cutting out a tongue to stop, um, or to, for people who spread malicious gossip, for example. Um, or possibly cells coming back, stopping reanimating the body. Um, here you can see you can see one's been put sort of into the side of the mouth, uh, and of course the very very well known example of um, a sheep um, a limb bone and a scallop shell from the Isle of May in the mouth. Um, but um, difficult to know exactly why that would be done. Um, but the individuals that we had at uh, the Blackfriars, there were, there were three males, or I think two males and a probable male, 
um, who had the stones in their mouths. Um, so the 25 burials that we lifted, we didn't actually have to remove all the burials because they were only going down a metre, so we left ones in situ on the edge and, and bottom of the trench. But, um, so we had 13 males and, and three females. Uh, so in the area to the east of the church, mainly males. Um, and interestingly, that one and possibly two of the individuals had signs that they had had brucellosis. Now, we don't have that identified from Aberdeen before, um, and this is a fairly new report, so I haven't had a chance to do a huge amount of research, but essentially it's more common in males and uh, common in people who work with animals, you know, who have close contact with dairy, um, you know, dairy animals, uh, people who are occupied, you know, um, working very closely with animals. Um, and it's more common in older people, people over 30. Um, and the f symptoms, sort of flu-like symptoms, um, weight loss, fatigue, things like that. Um, and our human bone specialist tells me that uh, the, the margins of the, of the vertebrae of the spine, are, which are slightly infected, are very symptomatic of uh, an identification of brucellosis. Um, we're actually doing um, work with the University of Aberdeen. Unfortunately, this site, they haven't, um, they haven't progressed the work a huge amount yet, but um, uh, some colleagues in the, in the university have been doing work on isotopes. And at the moment, um, uh, the specialist, well, Kate Britton in the university, she told me that the males at the east of the church are fishier, this is a te her technical term, are fishier than the burials on the other side and on the south of the building. Um, so I have yet to um, have that, you know, the, all the analysis done, but um, where she's been looking at other, um, for example, other friars and other religious organisations, she has been finding that, um, of course, the, the, there's a huge amount of fish in the diet in, you know, people in Aberdeen generally, but that um, the, and I'll t t show you the grey friars in a minute, uh, they're very, very fishy, so... <laughs> So there's a possibility that the males on the east side of the church, maybe who are buried with their head really close to the church, there's a possibility that they are, they were friars. Um, but at the moment, we, we can't say that definitely. There's a very small amount of pottery. I mean, the other finds were so very, very um, small number of finds. A few um, floor tiles, not in situ, but inside the building, that I think is probably the church. Uh, a few pieces of pottery. Uh, I'm just showing you this one. It's nice, sort of 13th, 14th century face mask here. This is one that we have from Aberdeen from a previous site. So very small number of pieces of sort of 13th, 14th century pottery. Um, and tiles from both locally made and also Dutch tiles. <clears throat> Excuse me. The... Um, there was no wood essentially remaining, but to find out a little bit about the coffins, we were able to get Anne Crone to have a look at the, the wood attached to the, the, the iron nails. Um, and we're actually quite lucky that the nails survive. Um, the soils in, in Aberdeen are so acid that quite often, you know, very little metal survives. But actually she had had enough to be able to say, you know, that uh, talking about the different materials, different woods that we use, so oak, pine, um, conifer, and also, you know, the, the thickness of the boards, which was interesting. Um, the um, inner boards thicker and the outer boards generally thinner um, and sometimes face, so oak exterior, pine interior, for example. Uh, and then just to, I mentioned the art gallery, uh, and I'm not going to talk about this, but some of you maybe will know that um, under Aberdeen Art Gallery, which has been having a refurbishment, they found quite a number of skeletons, which are, of course, associated with the ones that I've been finding, uh, and also probably Blackfriars. But uh, essentially, uh, just to show you a couple of pictures of that, and this work, again, is very early in um, post-excavation, so uh, we don't have much information about them yet, but essentially found quite a number of individual skeletons under the floors of the art gallery, plus also this fabulous reburial of hundreds of, or thousands probably, of, of bones um, that were reburied in, in wooden coffins here. So that'll be something I'm sure you'll be inviting them to talk about that in a future year when they've gone through the post-excavation. Um, but they're just a couple of pictures taken from the press um, of that. So. so that's quite nice. I've got sort of 25 and they've got maybe about 100 or so, not quite sure. But um, so that'll make a nice group to um, to um, to talk about. Um, and so then we got our carbon fourteen dates back, and I was slightly shocked when the skeleton that I found under here was actually dated to nine four one to ten thirty. So 
a couple of centuries before the Blackfriars was supposed to have been there. Um, and again, this is very recent, so we haven't had time to mull over completely. Um, but um, presumably an earlier monastic site, when this person had been buried east-west, very close to the area of the Blackfriars. You can see that the other burials are all coming in nicely. We had, I, I did four individuals who seemed to be buried, the very earliest one, the latest one, and you can see that's worked out quite nicely. We've got right from the beginning period of the Blackfriars to, to right towards the end, nearer to the Reformation. But this one individual who was buried a little bit further away um, and prior to the Blackfriars being in, on the site a couple of hundred years. So, uh, I mean, I've been in Aberdeen since 1985 and there's never been any suggestion that there was a religious site on that, you know, in that area before. But So that's something that we need now to do a bit more work on um, to see whether there is any other evidence of that. But, and obviously we'll be watching when they dig up pavements in this area in the future, um, looking for other skeletons. So that was the basis of the sort of start of the talk. And then, because that's not necessarily a talk in itself, I thought it'd be nice to compare to the two other excavations that I've done in Aberdeen of the other uh, friars. So, for example, the Grey Friars, um, a little bit about them. They were quite late, 1461 to 9, uh, setting up a house in Aberdeen. Um, and we know a little bit about, again, they, they took over buildings that had, were already there. Um, and then when they left at the Reformation, their buildings were then used for Marshall College, which some of you will know. Um, and this is just a picture to show you Marshall College, I'm sure, second largest granite building in the world. Or, um, so when that was being refitted for Aberdeen City Council to, to have that as a headquarters, um, they did a huge amount of work on the building. Basically, when they got in there, they found the building was falling down. So they had to put in these huge supports here to hold all the building up. You can see they've just got the facade here. They've taken away all the interior of the building and the back walls um, and essentially just left up the front structures, the main structures. Um, and so, again, we had to do excavation for all of these different pits and odd-shaped trenches. Um, you can see here, again, they've just got the facades, really, and, and then digging down, you know, to uh, create stable foundations for the new building and, and basements. So we did quite a lot of um, excavations in different places over Marshall College over a couple of years. Um, this was a fantastic opportunity to get up in a crane. Never, I never say no to that. Um, and to look down, obviously, on the site and um, the, the site of the, the church here, which I'm just going to show you some pictures. But it was a bit of a messy excavation because there were so many little trenches and funny shapes and you're always getting like a, a feature which was running out of the trench that you wanted to investigate but couldn't because we were only doing you know very very particular areas um i mentioned the buildings then were you reused um for marshall college for the protestant college which set up which then joined with king's college and became the university of aberdeen i mean we found a lot of evidence of these later buildings so for example this fantastic sandstone this is two metres down below the current ground surface in Marshall. We found these structures. Uh, we found a fireplace here, which was presumably to do with the quite late, you know, 17th or 18th century, presumably, use of the building uh, with plaster on the wall. I mean, we literally had the whole room, which had been presumably, well, it's either been a study or a, or a you know, a classroom uh, with the last fire set in it. Um, and then below that, we were finding these earlier buildings or earlier structures. So that's why some of the trenches look really strange, like this this long, thin trench with lots of different walls of different... I mean, it was a health and safety nightmare because there was so many... You were going quite deeply and there was such a lot of other activity round about that you had, you know, walls with fireplaces here. You can see we've got a, you know, a graded slope here just to get down to this. And they only needed a, a metre-wide trench, you know, to put in this foundation. But obviously we couldn't allow them to do that without. Um, so these some structures here that are uh, are to do with the friary or the earlier buildings that the friary had taken over. But we only saw tiny little glimpses of these in our little trenches. And in that trench below one of the floors of the building, we found uh, this pit with two pots in it. And... Um, we have since obviously had um, a report and it's likely that um, the large 
cooking pots here. It's one of these three-legged cooking pots, which probably comes from Holland, uh, and it's probably late 15th century in date, so 1450 to 1500 or so. And, um, and that would fit, of course, with the uh, Greyfriars coming to the site, taking it over. You know, is this a, um, a deposit for, you know, the, the foundation of the friary, where they put their... Um, you know, by the first friars who came to Aberdeen who were, who were rebuilding or uh, reusing the buildings. And why had they put this little bottle? This is like a, a locally made industrial bottle or um, flask, and they'd put that in the pit. And then they put, a, put a, um, a slate over the top and then covered it up. But it's rather nice that it does date to around about that period, so... Um, there are a number of, you know, obviously there are deposits in, uh, you know, are found um, related, you know, under floors and in buildings to, to relate to the sort of foundation of a, an establishment. So uh, that might be what that, this represents. And we also found uh, a little bit of evidence of the Church of the Greyfriars. Um, again, it had been, um, I showed you Parson Gordon, so this is it in 1661. And when um, Marshall College was being established, it was reduced in length, but it was still in use by the um, college uh, into the late 19th century. And um, it was only d fully demolished in 1903. Um, there was a huge uh, outcry in Aberdeen at that time. And in the local papers, um, a lot of the eminent arch arch um, architects of the time wanted it to remain and be built into the frontage of Marshall College. Um, and there was designs that they had created to show how this might work. But at that time, the planners decided they wanted to get rid of the old and to bring in this new, you know, full granite facade, um, which you, sh you, sh you saw in the picture. Um, and so it had got foreshortened and bashed around a little bit. But... Um, it was then fully demolished. So because it was so late, we have obviously images of it um, from that time, and a survey, a photographic survey of it was carried out you know, in the early 19th century. And so you can see a couple of the images of it here. You can see a rather short, sort of stubby church, but you can, there's quite a number of images like this showing various architectural elements. Um, and photographs like this um, and the inside of it, um, this is a, a picture showing the, uh, an extension which was built onto it here, uh, which has got a Latin inscription here, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and this is where the college professors and students sat for the services on Sunday, but uh, that's the interior of it just before it was demolished. Unfortunately, this is all that's pretty much left of it. Um, and the only reason this section of it was left was that when they built Marshall College, they put one of them, the, pit, the early 20th century pillars, and they used the medieval wall as a foundation for this pillar. And this is really virtually the only section of it that's left. Uh, unfortunately, there were no deposits with it, so no layers, no soil. The soil had all been dug out, um, and we've really just got a section of plastered wall surviving. Uh, and then this is just to show you, we have the plan of the church. Uh, this little fragment here is the bit that we were able to excavate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but associated with the friary, we were able to excavate several trenches in the sort of cloister area, so around about the, this um, extension to the church, um, uh, which had actually been built on one of the cloister walls. And so within the cloister, we found... Um, the remains of seven individuals, seven burials. Um, and this is a picture of them from the crane. So this wall is the extension that the professors and students sat in. And it had actually been built on the cloister wall, so there's an earlier wall underneath there. And then these seven individuals had all been buried with their heads right up against this wall. Um, but on a north, east, south, west orientation the same as the sorry northwest southeast orientation the same as the church which had been built um in relation to the street so but all um buried essentially east west and so you can see here the uh, earlier wall and the the burials here uh, i mean i'm shocked that they survived they were very deep burials but that with all the building work that had gone on round about them um it's amazing that they survived completely intact 
And these individuals had all been buried with their hands clasped, as though in prayer. So you can see this is obviously we're in the, in the grave here, and you can see the hands here, um, beautifully excavated, of course. Um, here, another view of them. So when we started digging down in the graves, usually the first thing you find is the skull, because it's usually higher up. The first thing we found was the tips of the fingers. And as we cleaned down the soil, um, all seven of them were buried with their hands clasped. Um, we found um, once we'd taken up the skulls we found on the back of one of their heads um, we found what we think is hair and again this is being looked at at the moment unfortunately I don't have a report on this but um, they were very excited to find that hair had survived just where the, the back of the head had been pressed against the soil essentially or probably in a shroud um, uh, and one of the individuals had fish in between the pelvic bones, fish bones. So you can see here, the arrow is pointing here, but you can see the fish bones here. Now, unfortunately, during a, a move from one store to another, these bones have been misplaced. And we know that they're in the store, but they're in a little bag and we can't find them. But our, human bone, um, our, our fish bone specialist says that um, she thinks they're probably fin rays, so the bones that go out into the fin, and that they're far too big to be, to be eaten. Um, so how they got there, we're not sure. Um, I know that experiments have been done eating fish, bone, but fish and bone, and analysing the result to see how they're chewed and how they're, you know. But this is like a queen mother getting a bone stuck in her throat situation. I mean, they're, they're too big probably to have swallowed. So the automatic thing is to think, well, it was a Friday, there had been a meal of fish and had died once the digestive process had taken, gone through a little bit. But um, at the moment, we're not quite sure. Um, and obviously, we need to find these bones to um, be able to say that for definite. But, uh, um, and then looking at the bones, we've got seven individuals. They're all buried with their hands clasped. Uh, they're all males, um, they're all elderly males, have osteoarthritis of the spine and various other, um, you know, um, uh, telltale signs of old age, shall we say, or hard work. Um, they've also got uh, quite a lot of um, evidence that when they were young they were quite ill or had pe periods of poor um, nutrition, so lines on the teeth here from when the teeth were developing, um, suggesting that they, as I said, they'd either had been ill or had poor nutrition, uh, and their teeth were absolutely terrible. Worn down, rotten, absolutely appalling teeth. Um, here um, we have possible leprosy, and again, this is the first for Aberdeen that of all the skeletons we've excavated, we've never had a definite case of leprosy, but this is um, fairly certain that this is, a, this is a, a case of leprosy, but you can see that the Bones are not that well preserved, but uh, the human bone specialist thinks that's m most likely. Uh, and of course, the Franciscan lifestyle was going out into the community, um, and so would therefore have encountered people who were ill, who had leprosy, who you know, had other diseases, and so possibly caught as a result. Uh, and this is just to show the... Um, work that's been done in the University of Aberdeen. Uh, the work at, um, I talked to you previously about St Nicholas, a lot of those skeletons have gone through this process of looking at the isotopes, um, and this is just a, as a sort of an aid memoir for that. But the Franciscans, I say, have not been um, fully um, analysed yet, but that they're very, very fishy, according to our, the specialist. Uh, this is the list, so in the... Um, the Aberdeen obituary calendar, the Scottish Greyfriars. Uh, this is a list of uh, Franciscans who were in Aberdeen and the dates in which they died and some of their occupations. And you can see some local names, Marshall, uh, some not quite so necessarily local names, uh, Van. Um, and we were wondering if presumably these seven were uh, friars who had been buried in the cloister with their heads next to the uh, cloister wall. Uh, and possibly some of these individuals. Uh, I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to say which ones are which, but um, you can see quite a number who died not long after the arrival, their arrival in Aberdeen. 
Uh, and then just to show you, we, we, we also were, uh, had trenches all over the place and we did find evidence of, you know, um, rubbish disposal. So at the back of the site where nobody, you know, off the street frontage, lots of rubbish was thrown into uh, the gardens there, which um, later became the what they call the college gardens. And so we had quite a number of things like um, bits of daub, lots of pottery, tiles, um, which maybe were to do with the, uh, when the friars came to Aberdeen, uh, they obviously had to do work on some of the buildings. Um, and so maybe, for example, the door, but there was a lot of it possibly coming from removing wooden buildings and maybe replacing them with stone buildings for their, for their purposes. Um, and then on to the White Friars, the Carmelites. Um, and again, we've done quite a lot of excavation work over a number of years uh, in this area of Aberdeen. Uh, again, you've got the Book of Owls here, you've got the White, white Cloaks. Um, essentially, the Carmelite Friary is um, on the sort of southern section of Aberdeen. So it sits, this is the River Dee, which is now the harbour. You've got the Denburn here, which is a burn that comes, still runs through Aberdeen and comes out into the, what well, essentially into the harbour. Um, and then you've got this marsh ground overflowed by the tide, inch overflowed by the tide. So this is the area of the Carmelite Friary, which is in a very, very marginal area of the, of the town. Um, and the Trinitarians, the Red Friars, are, are situated just to the, the side of the Carmelites here. So they were taking over an area um, in around about 1273 is the first reference we have to them um, in this very, very marginal land. Um, over, the, over a number of years, we were able to excavate different sections of this, this area. And so you can see this is just a, a representation of sort of all the trenches we've dug over the time between 1980 and 1994 to 5. Um, and so have got part of the church here, part of the West Range, and possible South Range, slightly off alignment, uh, and walls in, in the trench here. Uh, and also a possible um, east wall of the church here and graveyard in, in this area around about to the east. Um, the area, um, we have a reference to the green and the uh, Carmelites being set up in the Madder Yard in the green. And so we know from the excavation this was a greenfield site prior to the Carmelites taking it over and a sort of a very wet, boggy marginal land. Um, you can see plough marks on the site um, where the area had obviously been farmland um, and water running down the site this this ditch here this sort of meandering ditch would have taken would have, you know huge amounts of water uh, down the site and was filled with um, prehistoric flints which had possibly washed from a, an area you know up uphill and to the north the original buildings were in wood so we had a large number of post holes um, this is um, a line of post holes running uh, east-west, uh, and you have to believe me, unfortunately I couldn't find a picture um, which had actually got the, the, the stone church wall in here, but essentially this is east-west, um, and pre pre presumably and probably an earlier church as when they arrived in Aberdeen, and they set up wooden buildings. We've got um, you know, quite a number of records of things like uh, dedications, and um, people giving money and um, to the Carmelites, uh, for, for for example, um, you know, remembering people who had, had died, um, and so we have quite a lot of records of the Carmelites um, over the years. And then this is um, looking down on the sort of later phases of the, of the friary. So we've got the church here with the, um, the buttresses here and the church wall, the door and then cobbled surfaces here. Um, and at the Reformation, when this building was taken down, and again, there are quite a number of records of this building being taken down, we think that these cobbled surfaces had built up so that the lower levels of the buildings could not be seen. And so therefore, there were quite a lot of architectural elements still surviving in the buildings. So for example, the, the buttresses here were still standing to you know one course above ground level and also this well this is one of the two door stones uh, on the north wall which again the, had been covered up with cobble surfaces and so um, they either didn't bother to dig down to get the stones out or they didn't realize you know when they were they were just working from ground level uh, we had two mason's marks um, 
both, well, one from each, was it from the south wall buttress and the north wall buttress, uh, both the same, an M on its side with a tail. Um, I'm sure you, you know we, don't, we can't attribute a name to these um, mason's marks, um, but we have some information about some names of, of, of masons you know, who are working on buildings at this time. Oh, we had quite a lot of evidence of um, the building structures themselves. So I mentioned when I was talking about the Blackfriars that when they were dismantling the roofs, they would obviously keep complete stone slates um, or as many as they needed to, you know, for, for use elsewhere. But on the Carmelite site, they threw huge amounts off the roof and just left them lying to then get covered up. So we have a really nice selection of different sizes. So the longer, thinner slates. Now, these are... Um, Stone, I, I call them slates, stone roof tiles more, more technically. And um, the, the stone comes from sort of Tayside up to um, the, the sort of coast, the north, northeast coast of Scotland, um, from, that, from those um, stone quarries there. And so we know a little bit you know, um, about uh, the mortar that they use to create extra waterproofing. And you can see that on the, on the stone tiles here. Um, and a huge number of, of floor tiles, um, a number, quite a number that were very, very well made, some that were brought into Aberdeen, but quite a number that we think were made locally. And we found this, the, the, this base of a kiln here, you can see a um, cobblestone circular probable kiln with a post hole in the centre of it. And we, so we think of quite a lot of these tiles were made at the site, and um, quite a lot of them were very, very poorly made. So you can see here one that almost doesn't look as though it's been used and it's got scars where it's, attacked, it's been attached onto other uh, tiles in the kiln. And also ones that have got quite a raised green area here that almost look as though you couldn't walk on them. You know, they're so um, sort of convex. But um, we didn't find any in situ, unfortunately, and we, didn't, we found very, few evidence, very little evidence of things like mortar floors for, for you know for bedding in the tiles, but a large number in the demolition material. Uh, we found lots of tiny little fragments of window glass, and again at the Reformation they would have taken out all the windows. There was very little lead um, leading from the windows survived, and it would have been taken away, of course, and reused. But tiny, tiny little fragments of um, there isn't a scale on here, but very, very tiny little fragments of window glass. And so we have some idea of some of the, the types of glass, um, but we certainly know where the windows were based on obviously planning all the little fragments of glass. You know, we, we found areas where next to the church and the West Range where there had been windows, and you can see some painted, but mostly quite plain glass. Uh, and we have evidence of, uh, of things like scaffolding. Um, of course, we knew, know they would have used that, but um, a number of sort of small foot like sort of little pits, uh, fairly shallow pits that we think may have been associated with the scaffolding and the, for, of the, for the building. Um, an illustration here just showing possible what it might, might have been like during the construction. We know that they worked the stone on site. So the, the stone for the buttresses and the door, the stone came from Cowie Quarry near Stonehaven um, and it would have been bought, brought to the site in lumps and worked there because we found lots and lots of tiny little sandstone chippings where they would have worked the, the stone on site. Um, and we had, they had um, a running water supply from the earliest date, from the first stone buildings, um, so probably late 13th century. And we found altogether four, uh, evidence of four um, lead pipes. So one running right along the West Range here, and you can see that line is where the lead, lead pipe is still in situ. It hasn't been robbed out. But here you can see running next to the church where the clay that had been laid as a bed for the lead pipe has at a point after use been cut open and the lead pipe removed, again, presumably for, um, you know, for reuse. And this little pit, sorry, this is a terrible picture, but this is a little little pit with lots of drips, drips of lead in it. And um, this is just it, it half excavated and presumably a, a pit used for actually making the lead came, window cames um, and maybe joining sections of lead pipe actually on site. And this was just almost in the cloister area. So they were working the, the stone and the lead and everything very, very close to the site. 
Um, we found a nearly complete and part of um, copper alloy tap or spigot. Um, you can see here just a very basic handle here for turning the water on and off. And this was found in the West Range and probably it's quite, it's quite late in date, you know, um, 15th century probably. But we had fantastic um, press coverage at the time and they used all of the great, you know, plumbing headlines. Uh, this is just one of them, obviously. But we actually even made, you know, they used to, I don't know if they still do that, but the Press and Journal have little stands the, um, where they sell the papers and they, they put on the front of the stand here the headline or the, and it said, Aberdeen's earliest water supply, running water supply or something like that. I was driving down Union Street and I thought, oh, that must be us. So um, it was quite a big, this was, this was in, the, in, the, in the 90s we were doing this excavation. Um, so yeah, it caused quite a, quite a stir, a plum good find. Um, the West Range also was originally built in wood, so low, lots and lots of post holes. This is just one area where uh, a number of post holes with um, a clay floor, and this is the, the later uh, stone West Range buildings. Um, and in the West Range, we found a little room which had um, a lovely stone fireplace, and underneath, when we excavated it, a tile fireplace underneath. Um, you can see it here under excavation, the tile one and then the, the stone one, um, and a reconstruction of what, how, how that might have worked. Um, a very small room, but possibly for cooking for the, maybe for the um, prior or, you know, for a small number of people. Uh, and these co fantastic cobble surfaces around about the, particularly around the north of the Carmelite site, where we think people would have come in from the, you know, um, general pub public um, population of Aberdeen would have come in to a service or to, you know, for a burial, and they kept this area very, very clean. They relayed it with cobble surfaces many, many times, and this is the very latest cobble surface. You can see it's much later. It's been cut through with a pit, but you can see how they've beautifully laid those um, sloping down with a channel along the edge to take the water away. So this was the impressive end, north entrance into the um, friary. And I'll come back to that in a minute. We found lots of objects, obviously a huge number of little objects like little book fittings. Um, this is um, a lovely book which is in Aberdeen University, which is dedicated to the um, Aberdeen Carmelites. There's a, re there's a, um, a written in, in the frontispiece it says uh, Aberdeen Carmelites inscribed 1507 and these are some of the little fittings that we found that uh, would have been attached onto books or caskets um, and a very small number of bits of vessel glass but quite a number of nice really nice bits of pottery um, in Aberdeen we have a lot of imports in through the east coast so from places like Yorkshire Scarborough uh, you know East Anglia the Low Countries France um, and so quite a number of pieces, German stoneware, um, Dutch and French wares, and um, not, um, I think this Low Countries and Scarborough ware. Uh, and quite a number of coins now, delicately put. We don't find huge numbers of coins on digs in Aberdeen, but we occasionally find on sites like this, in, for example, wool foundations. So a number of these were actually found in, you know, we found several in, for example, the wool foundation of the West Range, um, whether that was then being put in specifically or, or falling out of pockets, obviously we're not sure, but some of these may have been, you know, um, you know put in on purpose. Um, and so quite an, a range of dates from the sort of mid 13th century through to the um, well, the, the, the building of the West Range, the, the, the Stone West Range. Uh, and other objects, for example, um, a, a bracelet on the wrist of one of the male friars, um, and a nice little die here, and um, other little pieces of jewellery. <coughs> and obviously, quite a number of skeletons. So, of all the, this is the, this is the, the, north wall of the church so in, in in the interior of the church quite a number of burials so over 200 altogether from all the, the work that we did um, this is one of the latest burials or two burials of two children which 
either were around about the Reformation or were just around about or before, or after, just after. Um, and this burial had um, displaced quite a number of human bones, which had been neatly placed here in a pile um, at the foot of the grave. But quite a number of other individuals, some in coffins. So, for example, we've got these deep burials here. All the little white markers are marking the coffin nails. Um, and some that were not in coffins and also in a sort of a clay soil. You can see how poorly preserved the, the um, bone is in a case like that. Um, but also some staining of coffins. So, for example, here you can see the staining of coffins where the bone seems to be more, you know, better preserved. Uh, and lots of little pins and twisted wires from, from shrouds. Uh, and again, this is one of our illustrators doing a, um, what a, a, a burial might have been like in, within a shroud. Um, and so uh, altogether we had, well, 201 individuals, obviously lots of disarticulated as well, um, around about, well, 46 males, 60 females, so around about the same, um, and quite a number of, of um, immature individuals as well, um, including uh, lines of small children buried nearer the walls of the church, um, possibly to protect them from being dug up again. So in the plan here, you can see the children's burials along the north wall here, um, that were better preserved than quite a number of the other individuals. Um, and the bones themselves tell um, a medieval story. Uh, quite a number where um, people have died or been injured in you know, close combat, shall we say. So um, this is a, a blunt uh, trauma to the head, bashed on the head. This is actually a slice taken off but not gone right through to the brain, so healed and, and went on to live and die of something else. Um, but this case where a sharp force trauma, so a blade, a sword, has come in through the side of the head, um, you can see it's cracked the skull um, at that time. But interestingly, the, the, there was actually a medical procedure, so they tried to, they took the scalp back, we think, and did, um, and because there's some little knife cuts around the edge here, that suggests they possibly tried to do some um, repair, some treatment, but um, there's no healing there, so this person didn't live um, very long. Uh, and other things like tuberculosis, so several cases of tuberculosis. Um, uh, this individual here was actually a young individual when they got tuberculosis and actually it healed, um, and um, an x-ray of another individual. Um, and this case of quite severe um, infection of the lower leg, so this is the lower legs and the foot, um, and again, this is a possible leprosy, but more likely to be arthritis uh, associated with psoriasis, which is, um, causes this is quite a severe infection, um, particularly of areas where there's not a huge amount of muscle coverage, so like the lower legs. And so... This site, because we've, we've been able to do so many bits of excavation around, I mean, I've obviously just summarised that for you, but we've actually got quite a good idea of what the, the layout of the buildings were like, um, and this was complemented by um, a huge amount of historical research uh, associated with the, the Carmelite Friary. Uh, and so this is um, using Parson Gordon's map of 1661, plus all the work that we've done on the excavations, um, we were able to, to look at the shape and layout and use of the different bits of the friary, plus the area around about, this is the, the, the green, the area which, if you go to Aberdeen, is, is still, you know, um, is still in use. Um, and to look at reconstructions of the, for example, the inside of the church, although we only were able to make, or mainly excavated the, the west end of the church, um, we were able to to do sort of reconstructions of what the, you know, the church might have been like. Um, and also, and this is mainly from historical research, look at the properties around about the friary. So, for example, we know that when you came into the green, which would have been where you came to first in the medieval period, coming from the west into Aberdeen, you'd have crossed over a bridge into the green, and then you would have actually gone down a little venel which is historically, we've never excavated this because it's all under buildings now, but you'd have gone down a venel and there was two properties known on each side before you got to the entrance into the friary. And this is just, you know, historical research um, and into the uh, 
gate here in the north wall and then into the door that I showed you. Um, so it's been a big project involving lots and lots of different aspects. Um, and so I'm just going to now, I've been indicated I have to do this. In the 90s, we got a company to do a visualisation for us. Um, and I'm going to show you that now. So coming into the green along, you know, as you're coming in from the west. Um, it looks a little dated, but um, still worth showing, I think. There were shops on the frontage of the green at that time, as there still are today, actually, in this position. There are still shops there. And then you come into the Venel. into a nice door on the north of the church and inside. We don't talk about the nave too much. We, um, of course, there would be a burial going on with all the burials that we found. The church floor would be being dug up all the time. Obviously the floor tiles and the window. The window's a bit fuzzy, you know, because like you cover with smoke, you know, things that you don't know much about. We, um, obviously our lovely buttresses. Um, we set it when the church was probably getting a bit more run down towards the Reformation. It was getting a bit, needed a bit of TLC. And then we come out into the area to the west of the West Range, which um, appeared to been for you know a lot of agricultural activity it would have been the, maybe the gardens of the friary along the west range into the little room that i mentioned with the fireplace um, and the hanging lum we So then I just want to thank a few people um, who helped, obviously helped, and um, you know, the funders. But um, so I hope that's been interesting, just to see the different um, excavations that have taken place and what, you know, if you do quite a lot of excavation in one place, um, you know, you can find out quite a lot. And um, um, thank you very much. <laughs>